Welcome everyone to this week's edition of the Extracellular Vesicle Club. Today we're going to be talking about a topic that's near and dear to many of our hearts, and that is what is in our preparations of EVs that we may or may not know about, and how might they be contributing to some of the effects that we like to characterize. Um, so I'd like to welcome Tom Roberts today, um, who has a group in Oxford, and he's going to be talking to us about some of the studies that he's done and published recently on myogenic differentiation and how the dose, the collection uh, media, and also some of the things that might uh, co-separate with the EVs um, could be contributing. So uh, before I hand it over to you, Tom, I just want to remind everybody that you can put your comments and your questions in the chat box. And then at the end of the presentation, I will allow unmuting um, and you can also share share your, uh, your video if you like. Um, so, Tom, thanks so much for joining us. I'm really looking forward to your presentation, and pl please go ahead. Well, thank you uh, so much for the invitation, and that uh, introduction was perfect as well. So, um, I'd like to talk uh, today about a recent paper we published. I'm going to sort of bookend it with a little bit of our past work over the last few years, which led us to where where we are today with, with this paper, and then a little bit of unpublished data at the end, which is also uh, related. So uh, the paper that I'm going to be talking about is published. So if you want to look at any more details, it's in uh, uh, molecular therapy nucleic acids. And uh, the work today is primarily being done by uh, Britt Hansen, who is a graduate student working uh, in my group. So uh, before we start, I just want to go through a few background uh, concepts uh, that are sort of needed to understand the sort of biological background of um, what I'm talking about, aside from the, the EVs, which I assume this audience is uh, very familiar with. Um, so uh, Duchenne muscular dystrophy is a disease that we work on here, uh, in several groups here in Oxford. Uh, it's a progressive muscle wasting disorder. It's caused by a lack of the dystrophin protein, which is kind of like a molecular shock absorber in, in muscle. And uh, dystrophic muscle is, is characterized by foci of uh, myo necrotic regions, which are uh, undergoing cell death, and then a compensatory reg regeneration, which is restoring the muscle there. And there's an unmet clinical need for min minimally invasive uh, biomarkers for, for this condition. So myomeres are sort of muscle enriched microRNAs. Uh, they're involved in uh, various muscle related processes. And I'm going to be talking today specifically about uh, microRNAs 1, 133, and 206, which are in two related uh, families. These are some of the uh, most studied microRNAs. Um, as you can imagine from the from the numbers um, and uh, yeah they're, they're they're very important in muscle development and growth and and then the model system that we're discussing uh, for this paper is basically myogenic differentiation and this is where undifferentiated but uh, committed myoblast cells uh, fuse and form syncytial structures called myotubes uh, and then express the molecular apparatus that's required for contraction. And this can be very easily modeled in, in cell culture, and it's kind of re recapitulates the situation that occurs in, in regeneration in vivo after injury or in these regenerating foci in the DMD muscle. And to initiate uh, differentiation is actually a very, very straightforward process. We allow cell cultures to reach confluence or near confluence, and then we withdraw serum. Typically that's with 2% horse serum, so very low uh, concentration of mitogens, and this enables the differentiation process to, to start and cells to fuse. But the, the process will equally work with other low serum or, or zero serum, or just DMAM will also trigger this differentiation. And uh, a key point to, to link these concepts together is that the myomeres are progressively upregulated during the process of myogenic differentiation. So in the undifferentiated state, myomeres are basically not expressed. And then as the cells fuse and form um, these nice syncytial myotubes, those microRNAs are very strongly upregulated. And uh, during that process, you can also detect those microRNAs in the cell culture media as well. So they're being secreted. So just to quickly run through why we care about these and why we were looking at uh, EVs and myogenic differentiation. Um, these microRNAs, the myomeres, are present at very high concentrations in or relatively high concentrations in the in dystrophic serum compared to wild type animals in the dystrophic mouse, which is shown. Um, I don't think you can see my cursor, but it's uh, shown here on the left panel. 
And the same is also observed in human patients where these micronase are very high in, uh, in dystrophic serum and at very, very low levels in, in healthy individuals. And you can see the fold changes here, but this is all log scale. And uh, yeah, so it's a very substantial increase. And if we look at the rock curve, these uh, micronase have very, very strong potential for discriminating between uh, affected and unaffected individuals. So there's uh, a lot of biomarker potential for measuring these micronase in the blood of, of patients. And importantly, these are also pharmacodynamic biomarkers. So when we use experimental therapy to restore dystrophin, in this case, it's uh, exon skipping using antisense oligonucleotides, we see a restoration of those circulating microarray levels back towards uh, the healthy levels. And this is again in, in the MDX mouse and mouse model of DMD. And in the purple bars here, you can see with increasing doses of the antisense oligonucleotide, the levels of these micronase are returning towards the, the WIPO levels. And when we've done profiling, either using qPCR arrays, which is shown in this top panel, or a small RNA-seq in the, in the bottom right, we see a, sh a, a global shift in those differentially expressed micronase from uh, being elevated in the dystrophic condition to being restored towards wild type levels. So a really obvious first question is, well, are these extracellular myomeres uh, located inside of extracellular vesicles, um, which was, of course, what we had hoped was the case initially. And the answer basically is no, uh, or, or yes, but but mostly not. So uh, we've used a variety of different assays, and they all point to uh, the amount of uh, micronate being contained myomeres from serum that are contained in the EVs is about one percent. So we've done differential centrifugation with re relatively low speed. We've done very high speed ultra centrifugation where it's clearly 1% uh, of the material comes down in the pellet. And we've done um, ultra filtration with one megadalton molecular weight cutoff filters. And there it's sort of about 18% of the material stays in the filters. If we use uh, size exclusion liquid chromatography after initial ultra filtration, uh, we see effectively the same thing. So here's a UV uh, trace from one of these um, size exclusion runs and we've separated the material into different fractions. And then if you look in this panel uh, labeled H here, you can see the, the expression of, uh, or the, or the uh, abundance of micronase in those different fractions. And you can see that there's a clear peak for the, for the myomeres, which are in these light gray colors in fraction four, which is clearly the protein fraction, F1 being the EV fraction. Um, and notably, LET7 is a bit different. Uh, LET7 tends to be more vesicular. And we see that across lots of different uh, experiments and techniques. So uh, if we perform a proteinase K sensitivity assay, we see that the, um, the levels of micronase in, in, in the dystrophic mouse serum rapidly decline, suggesting that the micronase, instead of being inside EVs, or uh, the majority are actually um, uh, stabilized in, in protein complexes. Uh, treatment with Triton X basically doesn't uh, have a similar effect, which we would expect would lyse the EVs and, and release the micronase into the uh, very uh, hostile RNAs rich uh, environment of the serum. And we were also sh able to show by um, immunoprecipitation that we could detect um, these myomeres associated with AGO2 and, and apolipoprotein A1. And those were results that were quite similar to um, those reported by, by others at around the same time. So we have we've proposed a model, and, and other people have proposed similar things, to uh, to basically explore the idea of whether the myomeres that are released from cells could, in some way, influence gene expression in um, in a recipient cell uh, through a sort of paracrine or sig or signaling function, cell to cell signaling function. And we think that there's a directionality to that effect, which must be that the mature cells are signaling to the immature cells. So in, in the uh, muscle niche, basically, we're talking about mature myofibers communicating with the satellite cells, which are the, the muscle stem cells. So in, a, in the context of a regeneration after injury or in dystrophic pathology, the um, cells may be releasing um, micronase either in EVs or, or in uh, protein complexes, which could then be triggering this, the resonant stem cells to activate and repair the damage of that, of that foci. That's basically illustrated in, in, in this diagram. So here you can see as the cells mature, these micronases are switched on, 
then in response to either degeneration of the fibers or, or um, during the process of regeneration, the microRNAs are, are secreted either in EVs or, or via other direct mechanisms, and that there would be a, a sort of signaling um, back to these immature cells. So to test this directly, we uh, engaged in a number of experiments, and this is, this is the work that's um, described in the manuscript uh, that I mentioned at the beginning. So the first thing we did was we took uh, C2, C12, these mouse um, myoblast cultures, we switched them to differentiation media, and then at that period, we also um, add a drug which is gonna inhibit exosome biogenesis. This is GW4869, which I'm sure many people will be familiar with, or we use heparin, which is uh, intended to block uptake uh, of EVs in the, in the recipient cells. And this is all happening in the same dish. So um, when we do that, we see a reduction in the level of myogenic differentiation uh, in, in these two groups. And that's quantified here in these panels. So uh, just to explain briefly uh, what, this assay, uh, what this assay is, uh, in the, at the end of the experiment, we stain the cells with an antibody that, that um, binds to myosin heavy chain. So this is basically staining those cells which have uh, undergone my, myogenic differentiation and are expressing the, 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 the contractile apparatus. So in that way, we can visualize the uh, differentiated myotubes in the culture. And then we quantify that by, um, we have a quick and dirty way, which is just to, to measure the uh, uh, myosin uh, heavy chain positive uh, space on the in, in the field of view, uh, or we can measure the myogenic index, which is the percentage of nuclei contained within a myosin heavy chain positive cell, or the fusion index, which is a slightly different variation. It's the percentage of nuclei within a myosin heavy chain positive cell that itself contains at least three nuclei. So this is basically how many nuclei are in myotubes if they're fused, basically. And then we also count the number of nuclei to see whether there's been a change there. And this is important because if there's an increase in the number of nuclei, that can then manifest as a uh, apparent increase in differentiation. Um, but it's not really a fair test because if you have more nuclei at the beginning, uh, that's a, that's a fun, uh, the level of differentiation is a function of how many nuclei there are. So there'll be, the, the level of differentiation will be higher. So we always control by, um, by measuring this as well. So the, initially, it, it suggests that inhibiting uh, EV release and uptake does impair myogenic differentiation, suggesting a possible paracrine role for EVs in this model system. If we do a similar experiment using an RNA interference approach to knock down uh, other EV biogenesis, biogenesis factors, here we're looking at the RAB uh, GTPases, as uh, RAB27A and RAB27B, uh, we found that if you knock down both of these simultaneously, you see a, uh, a similar reduction in the myogenic index and the fusion index, uh, but any of the uh, sRNAs alone did not uh, elicit such an effect. So suggesting there could be some redundancy uh, between those two proteins. Uh, then a similar variation of the experiment, we uh, collected conditioned media from uh, C2C12 uh, donor cultures that have been treated with uh, GW4869 and we transferred that onto fresh cultures at the point of initiating differentiation. And when we do that, we uh, observed a reduction in the uh, amount of fusion uh, of those uh, treated cells that, of, of when the parent culture is treated with GW4869. And the same was also true when we uh, treated the donor culture with the sRNAs targeting RAB27A and RAB27B. So suggesting that impairment of EV biogenesis in the donor cultures has manifested in a, a reduction in myogenic potential in the recipient cultures. Again, suggestive of a, um, a signaling function between uh, these kinds of cells. So this, the, the experiments in this paper kind of uh, go in an increasing level of complexity. So these are the, the, the very, uh, the most uh, crude experiments that we could do. So the next thing we wanted to do was to take that conditioned media and fractionate it using an ultrafiltration approach. And this is also still quite crude, but the purpose here is to try and uh, obtain different fractions which are somewhat equivalent, which would be both EV containing fractions and uh, non-vesicular protein containing fractions. Because as uh, hopefully I explained in the initial slides, there's a, there's a huge proportion of these micronase that are in the extracellular space that are not EV associated. So we wanted to assess potential phenotypic effects for both of these kinds of um, materials. 
So having differentiated cells and collected conditioned media, it goes through uh, various um, different molecular weight cutoff filters where we, um, uh, we, the retentate goes into a separate tube and then the filtrate is uh, continuously filtered. So we end up with these different fractions, which is basically the, the condition media, the condition media enriched for EVs, the condition media, uh, which is supposedly non-EVs, and then the sort of final flow through. So these are increasingly small uh, molecular weight cutoff, uh, cutoffs. And if we quantify this, oh yeah, so I should say, uh, then the donor cultures are treated with a mixture of this fraction uh, and fresh media. So the, the recipient cells are not depleted for glucose or any uh, other um, uh, uh, metabolites that they need to, to grow. And we assess both differentiation and, and proliferation via uh, EDU incorporation. So to quantify this, we observed quite a pronounced increase in myogenic differentiation with the condition media and to a lesser extent with the EV enriched condition media. Uh, we did see a small increase in fusion index for the non-EV fraction, but you'll notice that the number of nuclei has increased in that fraction as well, so uh, it's, it's unlikely to be the same uh, kind of effect. So these data are pointing towards a, a role for EVs in this cell-to-cell uh, uh, -cell signaling process uh, or, or phenomenon. So we next wanted to go to the next level of, um, uh, of sophistication and we wanted to uh, isolate as pure EVs as we could using ultrafiltration, size exclusion, lipid chromatography. And uh, so we collected uh, condition media from cells in the growth conditions and also cells in the differentiation conditions. We performed uh, UF uh, SEC as described here and then those are isolated EVs, these kind of pure EVs or purer EVs, are then treated, uh, uh, C2C12 recipient cultures are treated with those EVs at defined doses. And just to, because with this material we can scale up the process uh, quite substantially, we're able to do a lot more EV analytics, which I'm sure is of interest to this audience. So this is the, the UV trace from the um, size exclusion chromatography. Uh, the EVs are contained in these fractions, which were then pooled and concentrated. We performed uh, nanocyte, nanoparticle tracking analysis, and they have uh, uh, exosome or EV-like uh, characteristics. The, uh, the, the modal diameters were not significantly different, although they're, they're a little bit smaller in the, um, the myotube-derived EVs. And if we perform Western blot on these uh, isolates, they have um, enriched, they're enriched for uh, classic EV uh, markers, Alex. TSG 101, CD9, and uh, calnexin was only observed in the, uh, in the, in the, in the donor cells, the, the producer cells. So if we treat these um, C2C12 cultures, uh, obviously I should say also, uh, here's their electron micrographs, uh, which show the kind of cup-like morphology uh, consistent with, um, with uh, exosomes and EVs. Uh, and so these are the data from the, from the treatments. Um, we observed um, well, first I should say, um, to unpack this, we have the, the top line is the, the myoblast-derived EVs and the bottom uh, panels are the myotube-derived EVs. The quantification is all below. It's a little bit difficult to see from the, from the micrographs, but uh, ho hopefully you can appreciate that we used a very wide range of concentrations uh, over nine logs, so starting with two, uh, 2E2 and the uh, top dose is 2E11. Um, that's particles per mil. And um, we observed an increase in myogenic differentiation uh, for across a very wide dose range, but it was mostly in the lower end. Uh, so that that's can be uh, shown in these panels F, G, and H. So th this is the, the myosin hemogene plus of area, the myogenic index, and the fusion index. And the, the control, which is just differentiation media only, is this, this gray, uh, gray bar that shows the, um, the error bars for that group. So we're seeing an increase. Um, uh, across the board, but at the highest dose, we actually see a inhibition of differentiation, and at the second highest dose, it's not different from the control. So this is somewhat unusual and, and somewhat unexpected behavior. Um, we also, a couple of other notable things here. Uh, the effect is also seen at the at very low doses. So 2, 2 10 is a very, very low number of particles uh, to be added. So the idea that this is somehow a transfer of microRNAs 
uh, effects seems uh, somewhat implausible. And we also observed similar effects with the myoblast-derived EVs, which essentially don't express the myomeres or at extremely low levels. So again, pointing away from a micronade-dependent uh, uh, effect. And uh, of course, we quantified the micronades in these EVs and uh, using absolute quantification. And because we have the particle count from the, from the nanosite, we can determine the number of copies uh, of micronade per EV. And uh, it may not surprise you that they're very, very low. Um, so for mere one, it's about one in 6,000 EVs, one, one molecule of mere one in 6,000 EVs. For 133A, it's one in about 200, and for 206, one in about 500. So again, it's sort of difficult to, to um, believe that this is a uh, transfer of myomines, which is causing the pro myogenic effect that we're seeing in the, um, in the phenotypic assays. And of course, uh, I should say that uh, similar um, low levels of micronase in EVs has been reported uh, by others. This is an ex excellent paper that, that makes that point very well. So the next question is, well, um, can soluble proteins and potentially the soluble uh, extracellular micronate complexes, can they induce similar pro-myogenic effects that we observe with the whole condition media or with the, um, uh, the, the EVs from the previous experiments? Um, so what we did, the, one of the advantages of, of the liquid chromatography is, of course, we can collect the protein fractions simultaneously with the EV fractions. And um, we've treated uh, recipient cultures with those uh, uh, fractions of, uh, of soluble protein. And uh, the, to cut a long story short, um, we don't see any effects with the protein fractions when the EVs are collected in DMAM. Now, when we were initially doing these experiments, we used Optimum. And we found a very strong pro-myogenic effect with the soluble protein fractions, which got us very excited. And when we added additional controls, we realized that this was probably uh, experimental artifact. And I think that raises a really key point, which I want to discuss in the next few slides. But I just want to talk through um, what this figure is showing. So here's the, here's the control. This is cells treated with differentiation media only. And then if in this second panel, these are cells that have been differentiated in, in DM, the differentiation media, and then EVs collected in, in, D, in DMAM. Um, so there's no difference uh, between the, the control and these, these cells. And this is equivalent to the conditions that I've shown in all the previous slides for the, for the EV work. Now, in the second group, if you differentiate the cells initially in differentiation media and then collect uh, EVs in the OptiMem, perform the size exclusion and take this protein fraction I'm, I'm, I'll explain what protein fraction 12 is in a minute. You then treat with this fraction, you see a massive increase in myogenic differentiation. That's very apparent from the, from the micrographs. But if we invert the uh, experimental design and we initially treat with Optimem and then collect in DMEM, we don't see the effect. So it's not that Optimem is stimulating the cultures to release some pro-myogenic factor. It's more likely that something contained with it, within the Optimem is being co-purified and that is actually triggering the pro-myogenic effect. So we looked into this in, in quite a lot more detail. And um, here you can see uh, the, the uh, size exclusion um, chromatograph again. And we actually collected protein from all of these fractions, which are uh, illustrated by these uh, dotted lines. So, so that's 15 fractions in total. And we treated the uh, recipient cells with, with each of those protein fractions and quantified the myosin heavy chain uh, positive area and number of nuclei, and that's shown in these panels D and E. And um, panel C is just a, uh, showing the, the micrographs for two representative fractions. So we, they're, they're showed in gray bars here. Um, fraction three, which is a high molecular weight protein fraction, and fraction 12, which is a low molecular weight protein fraction. So I hope, hopefully you can see that there's a very strong pro-myogenic effect that's mediated by the low molecular weight fraction that's shown in these uh, bottom panels here, that's fraction 12 that I, I alluded to on the previous slide, but the high molecular weight protein fraction doesn't exhibit the same effect. And when you look at the quantification, it's quite clear that that's what's happening in the, um, in the low molecular weight, uh, sorry, the uh, 
high milk weight fractions, there's very small increase in, uh, in my gentle rotation. It's very close to the control, not, not statistically significant. And then um, as you go towards these lower fractions, the, um, the activation is uh, in, in my gentle rotation is, is observed across these fractions. So we figured, um, is this caused by a general increase in protein? So we treated cells with BSA at five micrograms per mil. There's no, no difference between cells treated with differentiation media only and cells treated with you know, BSA. So it's unlikely to be a non-specific increase in protein, which is in, uh, causing this uh, promyogenic effect. And then we wondered whether uh, it really was something to do with the optimum, which is uh, we had a pretty good idea that it was, but if we fractionate just um, plain optimum, not conditioned, just straight out of the bottle, and run it through the um, uh, the LC, we get this trace, and you can see that the uh, this is the purple sort of magenta line here, and this is a broad peak that covers uh, the area uh, that we showed was promyogenic when those protein fractions were transferred before. Uh, again, you can see this is in grey is, is fraction twelve. So if we take um, optimum that's been fractionated by in the LC, and we take the protein from, from fraction 12, and we treat donor cultures with that fraction, we again see a massive increase in uh, myogenic differentiation, and it's, uh, as, as shown in all of these uh, quantifications, as well as it's clearly visible in the, in the micrographs. Yeah, so I've just highlighted um, where the protein is in, in optimum, and, and maybe uh, I don't know, maybe, maybe people have thought about this or not, but if you look in the data sheet for Optimum, um, it contains about 15 micrograms per mil of protein. And uh, it doesn't say exactly what the composition is, but it, it contains insulin and transferrin. So we were motivated to see whether these were responsible for promyogenic effects. And uh, uh, so we treated um, some fresh cultures with uh, these proteins at one microgram. Uh, per mil, so quite a lot lower than what's present in um, or likely to be present in Optimum. And we see a very strong induction in uh, myogenic differentiation for those cells treated with insulin and nothing from the transferrin. So these data are pointing to insulin as a contaminant in Optimum that's co purifying uh, in the LC with the protein fractions when we use that as an EV collection media. So um, that was. Uh, obviously quite disappointing initially. I mean, the biological finding is that the, the protein fractions don't in, induce any effect. Um, but this, we, we got quite interested in this, the compounding factors of using Optimum. And we reasoned that if you use a polymer precipitation method, which I know is very discouraged in the EV community um, uh, for very good reasons, but it's still widespread by people who are sort of coming into the EV community or um, you know, applying EV research to their particular research niches. Um, but if you use these polymer precipitation techniques, they could be um, basically building on top of this confounding effect. Uh, if you have Optimum, you could be co-purifying the uh, Optimum derived insulin with the um, uh, PEG precipitation or the polymer precipitation uh, kits. So we wanted to basically take uh, EVs from LC purified material and from uh, exequic um, purified material and compare to see whether this, there would be an effect of the, um, of the insulin in this case. So this is the, ex the experiment. We've collected cells in similar ways to before, uh, harvested by either of these uh, methods as described and then treated cells in a very similar way to describe in the proof experiment. The uh, nanocyte traces are shown in, in, in panel B. And uh, we did indeed find that if you prepared the, um, oh, I should say as well, because we were able to do this because in the uh, dose response with the LC derived EVs, there was a concentration where they were had no additional effect. The, the effect was basically neutral. So we picked that concentration as a way of uh, seeing whether the uh, co, -purific co, co purification of optimum derived factors would alter the uh, differentiation profile in the recipient cells. So we've got two different kind of collection um, regimes. Uh, in both cases, there's differentiation initially, and then either collect the EVs in DMEM or in OptiMEM, and then either it's formed by LC or using the exequip method, which is the, the polymer precipitation. And you can see that the exequip derived 
uh, MyTube EVs have a very strong pro-myogenic effect. It's only observed when the material is collected in optimum. So it suggests that the, the, the matrix, the precipitation matrix from the exequit kit is co-purifying insulin from the, from the optimum. And that is actually what is causing the phenotypic effect that's observed in the recipient cells. And uh, in contrast with what we saw with LC derived EVs, this effect was strongly dose dependent, such that if you increase the dose, uh, you see a massive increase in myogenic differentiation, consistent with uh, an, an increasing dose of some soluble factor, very probably insulin, which is uh, triggering this uh, phenotype. So um, I just want to very, very quickly touch on some unpublished stuff because um, I think there are some additional problems with uh, polymer pre precipitation methods which are worth highlighting and, and, uh, and this is all uh, totally new. So uh, we were interested in, uh, we, we showed very conclusively that in the uh, MDX mouse, the, the dystrophin deficient mouse, that these zero micronase were mostly non-vesicular. We haven't actually ever published that that's also the case in DMD patient serum. So that's what I'm showing here. We performed uh, proteinase K and uh, Triton X100 sensitivity assays. And I hope, hope you can see that when you treat with proteinase K, and this is uh, uh, four patient um, serum samples, you see a, a rapid drop in the, in the abundance of uh, all the myomeres. And um, we have two controls, MIR-16, which is known to be a non-vesicular microRNA, and LET7, which is frequently uh, enriched in, in the EVs. And there's a clear difference in those controls. And conversely, when you do the Triton X100 sensitivity, the myomeres are basically unaffected, similarly MIR-16, but LET7A is, is, um, is destabilized and the abundance level drops. So these data point to the myomeres being primarily non-vesicular in uh, patient serum. But what if you do exequick on these samples? So hopefully you can see that the results are completely different. Um, if you perform exequick and collect the pellet, which should contain the EVs and the supernatant, and you analyze these separately, these point to the samples being mostly um, vesicular, or at least very similar. Whereas LET7 is, uh, is consistently, uh, 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 just comes in the pellet, which is, makes sense considering that it's mostly vesicular only. So uh, clearly you're getting completely different results when you use the polymer precipitation method to using um, other methods, um, which all point in the opposite direction. And it gets worse because um, because you use a polymer precipitation method, the level of recovery is going to be dependent on the amount of precipitation matrix that you use. So we performed this experiment where we used the recommended amount of the exoquick um, precipitation reagent, and then we also performed it with double the amount of precipitation reagent. So uh, this is the, the data for um, uh, let seven, which it doesn't really make much difference because this microRNA is mostly vesicular. But for MIR-16, which we know is mostly non-vesicular, you actually see opposing effects just by changing the methodolo methodological uh, uh, setup. And this is because you're basically um, saturating the, um, or sorry, the matrix is not saturated in the in the one X experiment. And then you add more, you're basically bringing down even more of the non-vesicular microRNA. So you would conclude erroneously from these data if you perform this experiment that this microRNA is entirely in, in EVs and we know from multiple other experiments that that's just the opposite is true. So just to summarize, uh, EVs can promote myogenic differentiation in, in multiple different um, experimental setups but the effect sizes are quite low when we use purified, uh, LC purified uh, EVs. Now the dose is critical and depending on the dose you can get completely opposing results. You can see activation of myogenic differentiation, you can see inhibition at very high doses and there's also a dose where there's no effect. Um, and we also observe these um, effects at very very low doses which points to uh, a, a away from a microRNA transfer mechanism. Potentially the surface signaling effects or it could be stimulation of paracrine release. Um, could explain those uh, those observations. Um, we, we strongly don't think that the effect is microRNA dependent. Um, the stoichiometry doesn't make sense. The level of microRNAs, uh, levels of microRNAs in, the, in these EVs is extremely low. Uh, and we see effects with myoblast derived EVs where the microRNAs are essentially uh, absent. 
extracellular protein didn't exhibit similar effects to the EVs. Um, and we also highlight these few cautionary tales relating to the use of OptumM as uh, introducing insulin, which can potentially confound the experiments. I didn't mention this, but obviously insulin is going to signal through the PI3 kinase AKT pathway, which is a major pathway regulating uh, muscle growth. Uh, uh, so when you use polymer precipitation, you're introducing all kinds of other problems, especially if you have any soluble factors in your biological system that could co-precipitate with that, uh, with that the precipitation matrix, uh, which could lead to very erroneous uh, conclusions. And also the, the, in the new data, I think, I hope I've convinced you that you can get very, very misleading results, even in just biomarker discovery, measuring microRNAs and biofluids in more general outside of uh, uh, the kind of phenotypic work that I described earlier. So I just want to finish on, on, on two provocative final statements, which I hope will maybe generate some thought or, or perhaps discussion. Uh, what the first one is, has the importance of EV mediated microRNA transfer in biology been overstated? And the second is, how can we convince researchers who are outside of the EV field uh, to stop using polymer precipitation techniques? And I'll just thank all the people from my team who did the work, who were involved, especially Britt Hansen. Uh, and I'm very happy to take any questions. Well, Tom, I've been, <laughs> I've had my camera off, but I've been over here shaking my head the whole time you've been You've been talking, especially these last few minutes, because, you know, this is a struggle, I think, that has gone on in the EV field for a very, very long time. Um, and I'm going to allow people to unmute themselves here and start their videos. But for those of you on the call, um, please put your comments and questions in the chat box. I will allow unmuting. Um, I, I am allowing unmuting now, but I will I will call on you um, in turn um, as we go through the chat box. But, you know, Tom, it, the the MICEV guidelines, so this the, the minimal information for studies of EVs, it was um, you know started in 2014 by an editorial of the ICEV board, and part of the reason they came together to to issue these recommendations were because of concerns about these non-specific techniques, and it's not that PEG is alone here. Um, you know we have varying degrees of specificity and of yield for all of our separation um, technologies, course, and yeah. certainly PEG can have its its uses, but. The problem is that today, you know, 12 years or so after they were first put out, these so-called exosome isolation kits that in no way isolate exosomes, in no way isolate EVs, are still being marketed as such. Yeah. yeah. What and what do what do we do about this? Yes, we issue guidelines and so on, but um, but there has to be an awareness, and I and I call on these companies to please, please. Mm. Put out some disclaimers here, and if, if you can, please just rename these things because they are not EV or uh, certainly not exosome isolation technologies. I 100% agree with that, and I think you know the, the approach that we've taken is to try and use multiple parallel approaches to attack the problem from slightly different uh, directions. Because of course, as you, as you you said, there's no perfect technique. All of these techniques have have problems, but. I think it's a lot easier to use the total exosome isolation kit or exoquick and then get your high impact paper. And when you when you use these other other methods, the results tend to be slightly less interesting. So um, and that that creates a problem <laughs> for the field. So um, yeah, and yeah. you you can see how this develops too because when you when you enter you know the terms that you think you want to search for exosomes isolation, these are the first things that come up. And um, and then you of course think, well, this is great. I can just um, order this kit, do something in a tabletop centrifuge, and I can get around all these supposed problems. Um, so so it's understandable why people are led astray here. But I I um you know I I really wish that these companies would would come up with a better explanation of what they actually have. But you know this is um. This is a there's a wider problem here too that I think you've touched on, and that is that we often don't know what are in the reagents that we're using. So just as people don't realize that their exosome isolation kit is just PEG, we also don't know what are in these um, culture media. And you know, recently one of an undergraduate, very very good undergraduate working in my lab, went went to the trouble of trying to find the the actual compositions of some of the media. And we can look back at old papers, you know, from the 1960s. We can look at patents that say, you know, this may or may not be in the formulation. But we don't, in most cases, actually know everything that is in um, these media that we're using. So I, I think yeah. you you really sounded a good note on the on on that point too. I think we, we give a lot of trust to uh, Thermo Fisher Scientific, right, with our uh, reagents. <laughs>
Yeah, I mean, and and really, any um, you know, we 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 know that things work, but we forget that we don't know why they work, um, and and um, and sometimes our experiments deserve a little bit more control. Um, and that's that's why it's so, it's very important and my sub calls for this too that when you do a functional study, you want to include the so-called process control. you know have that cell medium that has gone through the whole process just like your um, just like in, you know a, a real EV separation um, and and check to see what's actually there. So I will stop. Um, I will get off my soapbox here for a second um, and invite um, Phil. Phil Askinese, you have a you have a few questions here. Well, yeah, I, he answered ad nauseum about the non-vesicular miRNAs, but what about the this annoying finding that's uh, repetitive that that a few miRNAs uh, seem to do a lot of biology and. Uh, what is your current thinking about that? Um, well, I mean, yeah, it's difficult to answer, really. I mean, I'm not sure which specific uh, case you're referring to. I mean, I tend to believe that there's a you need a one to one relationship in the in terms of the, the micro A with the, the target for uh, many of these effects to be um, to be to be meaningful. Um, but yeah, you, had, I mean, you had effects at the, you know, one, oh, uh, with with our effects, yeah, <laughs> with one our effects, one hundred, one hundred yeah. thousand, yeah, and yeah, no, so those are very, very small. Multiple yeah. people over long periods of time, including our laboratory, have shown this, and uh, it's been difficult to understand or and present to the world outside of the EV uh, community. Yeah, I I think it's a it's a it's a problem. Right? <laughs> I don't have a good answer. Well, could there be other other RNAs? Other uh, well, def I mean, yeah, I mean, definitely that's the case that there is a diversity of uh, small RNA species in in, uh, in vesicles and and in the extracellular space. We have a um, we have a paper. It's not an EV paper, but it's a small RNA seq paper from from Serum where we characterise the different biotypes of um, of small RNA species in in, uh, in mouse serum. But I think that. Um, there's a bit of a problem there with the annotation. The annotations get kind of poorer and poorer the further the way you move away from microRNAs. So, um, I mean, it's a sort of a technical limitation for working on some of those species. Um, and I think that you start to also get some some artifacts as well. Um, it would be but, nice uh, to be able to separate the low miRNA vesicles from the from the uh, no miRNA and high uh, mm. uh, fractionated yeah. according to that that would be a nice dream yeah I, I think that again it should emphasize that those uh low micronase it's per micronase so and in and, it, and an individual EV may contain other micronase uh, yes. 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 but but it's um but for our specific favorite candidates that's uh the numbers are very low yeah, yeah. So Could Tom, be... the one the one microRNA that you showed there was uh, let seven A, and you yes. said that you find that this is often enriched in the EVs, um, or enriched in the EV fraction. The um, yes. do you do you know why that is? Do you believe that there is actually a sorting motif, or do you think it's more complicated than that? You know, we've had so many studies that have reported sorting motifs, but then they don't seem to be uh, replicated between studies. Well, at the risk of saying something controversial, I don't don't really believe in sorting motifs for microRNAs. Uh, I think there's just not enough information in the 20 tumor to to signal um, some complex sorting mechanism. And of course, these are, uh, it's also the implication there is that the sorting is dependent on um, you know the cell state or or, or whatever. A, a, a thing, an alternative. I, I mean, maybe this is a trivial. Um, uh, explanation that someone else has thought of but I mean you could get the same results if the micronase are piggybacking on some other thing which is itself sorted so that could give you a sequence dependent sorting but it's not really a motif if that makes sense so if, if the uh, micronase binds to a long long coding RNA or a messenger RNA which is itself uh, contains some trafficking signal then that makes more sense to me but I mean these are just my hand waving hypothetical i don't have any data to 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 back that up it's just my that's just my my two cents 
Well, of the total RNAs, the microRNAs are less than 1%. Yeah. Uh, so we're, we're, we're missing a lot in what we don't know how to measure the biological effects of. Exactly. Yeah. And we're learning more and more about what microRNAs interact with, not just messenger RNAs, but also other other RNAs. So I think the I think your point is well taken. It could be that you have a, a several degrees of association here before the before the sorting occurs. Yeah. Um, very very good points. Uh, Phil, did you have another question or? No, that's it. Thank you. Thank you. Very 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 thorough work, typically from Oxford. Thank you. <laughs> and, and Matthew Woods world. Yeah. I mean, Matthew's orbit. Yeah. <laughs> um, I have just one other thing, oh, actually, just to your point, Ken. Uh, Let7, uh, although it's enriched in EVs um, and EVs from myogenic cells, um, it's very highly expressed in muscle as well. So th there's, a, there's an interesting selectivity in the release of microRNAs in the disease state. So it's not just passive secretion, like it's kind of how people think about serum creatinine kinase, right? That this is passively leaking from damaged muscle. There's, a, there's something more complex. Um, otherwise you'd expect that LET7 is also similarly secreted into the, into the media in the same way that, or with the blood, like MIR1, and 1, 3 and 206. So there's something, something complex and interesting happening there, which we haven't fully worked out. Yeah, and those are exactly the kinds of observations that can lead to important, important findings. So yeah, thanks for sharing that. Um, Rink Newland, you have a question about the source of these microRNAs. Yeah, it, it's a very simple question, probably, Tom. I'm completely not in microRNAs, but you started with saying that you measure the microRNAs in serum from mice. Yes. I was just wondering, have you ever tested plasma and do you see the same then? Or is it really um, serum specific? So we, uh, so actually, I've never worked with plasma, although we have in our, our lab done very similar experiments, and it's it's of course the results are very similar. The reason why we don't use plasma is uh, that often, not always, but many kinds of plasma contain um, additives that can inhibit PCR. So heparin is a PCR inhibitor. Mm -hmm. um, so we basically because we we have a lot. I mean, our work is very uh, qPCR dependent. We've basically uh, stayed away from from that material uh, and just stuck with the serum. Yeah, okay, okay. And if I may, I have one other small question. Uh, sure. Is that about, uh, okay, so so you expressed the dose of vesicles that you add in a couple of experiments as particles per mil. Yeah. Now, uh, half of my group or our group is, has been working on measuring the concentration of vesicles in, in plasma and body fluids for over 10 years. And actually, we are still unable to do that, to be honest. So I'm, I was wondering if, if you express vesicles as particles per mil, what, what do you mean by that? And what fraction of your particles is really vesicles? So the, yeah, so that's a great point. So the part, yeah. So, um, I mean, we've deliberately said particles for that reason. Uh, the particles are counts are coming from the uh, nanoparticle tracking analysis. So, um, mm -hmm. yeah, so of course, some of the, I mean, the particles obviously represents a, a diversity of different subpopulations of, of different kinds of EVs. And maybe there's other things in there which are counted as particles by the by the nanosite, which may not be bona fide mm -hmm. uh, EVs. Uh, of course, that's true. Um, if, uh, in, in case you're interested, we also <laughs> Uh, worked out what the equivalent uh, in protein per mil would be as well. Mm -hmm. So uh, I think at the low end, the low end of our dose range would be in the picogram range, and the high end would be in the uh, micro uh, microgram per mil range. Okay. So I mean, we covered the whole, basically the whole range of what's practical in that experiment. But yeah. that that maybe gives it some context. Um, but yeah, take, points taken. Okay. Yes. Thanks very much. Clear. Thank you, Rink. Um, we have a comment from Alessia Brancolini. I think this is a very, um, a, a very astute comment too. So, Alessia, please, um, if you'd like to make this to the group. Uh, thank you. First of all, thanks, Tom, for the really, really nice talk. And yeah, my question is super pro provocative. I'm a PhD student. I did work in a company here in Vienna called, called Eversight. And we are working on immortalization of mesenchymal stem cells and in parallel enriching EVs to test 
MSCs, their IVBs for different therapeutic purposes. And in all our essays, we have these huge issues of using unconditioned media as control. We use CFF for EV enrichment. And the striking thing is that yeah, the unconditioned media is actually acting very differently compared to the vehicle, uh, like PBS or HIPAS media control and compared to our EVs. So we are keeping constantly asking ourselves if this is the best control, considering that actually the unconditioned media contains a lot of nutrients, factors, and whatever that is are usually consumed by the cells that are, and so these factors are not that present anymore when we enrich these unconditioned media. Um, so which is the best control to use in these essays? So I think, I mean, when we've, uh, okay, so, I mean, there's quite a lot of experiments. So I'm not sure which one exactly you're referring to in, in, in our study, but I mean, we, um, so uh, all of the treatment groups in, in our study are receiving the differentiation media, uh, and then um, the EVs are on top of that. So the, they should be receiving the same level of, uh, or, or very similar level of uh, sort of nutrients and glucose and, and, um, and uh, whatever. Maybe I've misunderstood the question. Um, uh, well, maybe okay, yeah, you know, it this might be more for, more, for, more for me, maybe in the comment oh. that I made about the unconditioned medium. Is that right, oh. Alessia? Yeah. So, so we, we did yeah, a- it was the unconditioned media because you showed the slide in which you were testing like only optimum uh, so unconditioned media optimum and uh, amazing cold and there were like this comparison of the unconditioned media amazing cold and if I'm not mistaken and optimum is it okay so if it's if I go back to this experiment perhaps I can clarify uh are we talking about this one yeah yeah so um this is the what we did in this experiment was we sorry it's a bit complicated and um, I can understand the confusion so the the optimum has gone through the LC we collected this protein fraction, fraction 12, and then that's added to complete DM. So the, the cells are receiving complete um, differentiation media, as same as the control. And then the only thing that's ad additional is that that protein fraction is being added uh, to that well. So um, I think that's the best we can do, really. Uh, yeah, yeah, of course. But the, my question is then yes, but this protein fraction would contain some proteins that are usually not present when the cells are taking up some proteins and consuming some proteins. So when you use it like unconditioned, of course, the, the, uh, this protein fraction will have something else that yes. is not usually present. In I the see. I see. So you're saying that the the process, the actual, the the action of it being on the cells is, will change the composition of of it. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Of course, this is a yes. super, super like no. Uh, well, I, I mean, provocative I question because there, <laughs> I, my from my point of view, there is no really an answer of how yeah. to tackle this issue. Yeah, but this is what we are facing. Constantly. I certainly, uh, I certainly, I, I, I hadn't, <laughs> I hadn't really thought of that to be honest. Because I mean, I think that's a, a good point, but I would argue that probably the effects of uh, the things that are added by the cells will be will dwarf the effects of things being taken away. I mean, I imagine that the, uh, the, 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 uh, it would take a while, a few days to deplete the reagent. Actually, I guess it doesn't, yeah, I guess it would depend uh, on the on the individual reagent. But I mean, yes, I take the point, but we've inde independently uh, performed experiments which test the individual uh, components. So. I don't yeah, think it affects I, the experimental experimental interpretation here, but yeah, yeah, I, but I, I, I see the point. I completely agree, and indeed, we are still using this unconditioned media as our control with the vehicle control. So we have two controls in our essays in order to exclude any possible contaminations coming from the medium. But still, of course, what we have to take in mind, consideration that the, also this control can contain something that is not comparable to what we have in our media from cells. Yeah. Great point. I was trying to say that I agree with Alessia that this is not, um, it's not a perfect control. And ideally, the, the greatest thing would be if we had some cells that we could incubate the media with that would take up stuff from the media, but not release anything. Unfortunately, yeah. that's not a biological <laughs> reality. So yeah. we can't really do that control. So sometimes, you know, we have to combine multiple controls like using the unconditioned medium, 
for some things, but then, you know, doing depletions like EV depletions or large, you know, large particle depletions, um, and then looking at what's left. So, so I think, I think that um, you, you do make a very good point, Alessia. So I think that brings us to the end of the questions in the chat box. And uh, so, so Tom, I, 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 I really appreciate your presentation here and the, the work behind it. Um, and um, I, I almost feel like I can retire now and you, you can take over because you're saying so many things that I agree with um, and, and saying them very well. So, so keep up the good work. Um, thanks everybody for joining and for the good discussion. Um, and we will look forward to uh, more progress from your, your group, Tom, and also to, uh, to seeing everybody again soon at a, another EV club. Thanks very much, Ken. Take care. Thanks, now. everybody.